to say I'm Christian. Yeah, in terms similar. Of, yeah, we have a lot of similarity, but there are, we have differences yes. in, 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 the, in the divinity of Jesus and yes. how we see Jesus. And, um, you know, our idea of concept of God, you are clear about it? Or? Um, I know some, yes. Uh, I know, I know that you believe that Jesus is um, not not God. He's a prophet. Yes. Um, yeah. And and um, and uh, we say Allah is the creator, and um, Jesus was someone a creation basically, just like Adam, Abraham, Noah, all of them. So we say that. Jesus was sent to children of Israel as a messenger, remind people to worship God alone. And there is one interesting verse in the Quran, you can have a look. Allah said, you know, Ma kana Ibrahim a So Allah said, Abraham was neither a Jew nor a Christian. So when we are arguing about the Jewish, Christian and Muslim, then in order to relieve our confusion about the divinity of Jesus, if Abraham was a Muslim, then there shouldn't be any religion called Judaism. There shouldn't be any religion called Christianity because both comes after Abraham. Uh, Do you see yeah, my point? I would say that um, Abraham himself was Hebrew. I don't think that he would have called himself a Jew. I don't think he would have called himself a, a Christian, Christian correct. or a Muslim. Yeah, uh, no, when we say Muslim, the definition of Muslim means someone submit himself to God. Right. So maybe, you know, in the time of um, Ibrahim, we have Sharia, which is the, uh, the legislation, the, the path, way of how to live our life, everything. This was probably some differences. But the concept of submission is always the same. So we believe that Adam was sent by God as a first man, a first prophet, that to worship God alone. And this message continue because soon as messenger goes away, uh, the original message changed due to the desire of human being. And sometimes it can be related to, you know, some people's personal interest. They spread um, out of their interest. So they change the message. And the Quran constantly reaffirm in the Quran that this is indeed a word of a God. The, the, the scripture of the previous generation has been altered so therefore it was a necessary thing that God should send us a communication so that me and you shouldn't be living in confusion so I have a question how is a Muslim saved or, okay. yeah because you're saying like you say that Abraham was Muslim mm -hmm. what does that mean Abraham? okay okay so let me give you the concept of original sin and I think that will clarify to you. So original sin in the Christianity that, uh, you know, due to the sin of Adam, because he committed this, he violated the command of God in terms of Christian understanding that he, you know, he committed that sin and because of that, he has to redeem that sin and therefore God is taking his son as a sacrifice to make everyone, you know, um, what do you call it? Yeah. What do you call it? Uh, reconciled. Reconciled, whatever, yeah. yeah. So what we believe, just go back to original sin. In Islamic understanding, we believe no original sin, original goodness. Because every children born as pure, we don't give attribution of sin to a children. So therefore, we call it masum, means sinless. So therefore, then sin, the definition of sin is is when God gives a command and out of you know your conscious mind you know it's wrong yet you do it that's called sin in a simple term so a baby is not in a state to choose that so if baby does something it's not considered as sin because he doesn't apply the consciousness the consciousness didn't develop that much right so therefore we say any sin will human being commit it will be an acquired sin and acquire sin will be redeemed through repentance, tawbah. And Allah said, you know, and Allah said, you know, promise that whoever come back to him with sincere repentance, Allah will forgive. So 
in Islam that sin is not going to exchange with no one. Allah said plainly and clearly, Wala taziru Every soul has to bear their own accountability. So on that note, our salvation is through tawbah and mercy. Mercy. I'll tell you why. Some people say, oh, Islam is a work-based salvation. No, it's not the case. And from the prophetic teaching we know, there was one person who wanted to go through paradise just because of his deed. And Allah put his eye in one scale and put all the deed in one scale. The eye outweighed the, the deed. So therefore, even if we whole of our life we pray, the blessing he has given us, we cannot repay through our worship. So therefore, Yes, you agree. So therefore, no one going through just the deed. We go through paradise due to the mercy of God. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Muhammad peace be upon him said, that you hope for mercy from God. And he is, you know, like 17 times a day, we minimum we say, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, the most merciful, the most kind. Why? Because that we need that mercy to go there. Now, in order to receive that mercy, now imagine, in order to receive, you wanted to receive a mercy from your teacher or someone, a condition needs to be there. And that condition is called obedience. So when we pray fast, all these things to be obedient. But this will actually not let you. It is the ultimate mercy of God will let us to paradise. But that will help you to go achieve the mercy. So therefore, often I heard that Islam is a work based salvation. I don't want to secure paradise, which is not right. Because Islam is a mercy based concept. And Allah said, is it is fair that everybody should bear their own accountability. No one should carry no one's sin. And that is the in line with the message of all the prophets. And even Jesus himself. You know, Quranic account of Jesus is amazing. You know what Jesus, uh, we agree with his, you know, he healed leper, he cured the blind, and Quran mentioned about his uh, miraculous birth. And he speak on the cradle. This has been mentioned in the Quran. Allah said he is Messiah. You know, all those things, <coughs> sorry, all those things uh, Jesus perform miracle and he said look this is from the power of Allah Allah have given these attributes of miracle sorry this so that the community can accept him as a messenger because they are disputing his message so in order to be a messenger you must convince your community that you are a messenger and that convincing can be possible when you offer some miracle and that's why God sent uh, every community a messenger. Allah said, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهِ وَجْتَنِ بِالتَّعُونَ Allah sent every nation as a messenger. Saying that you should worship Allah alone and worship the false God, false notions, false ideology. And the message is simple. Jesus brings the same message. And Allah mentioned in the Quran that that why Allah send message again. So you know, so that when when the message has been corrupted, we don't know what's happened. We actually basing our belief based on some people. But when Allah said no, I will take on my hand. I want to relieve confusion. And that's why he said Prophet Muhammad Messenger. And the Quran is a book called Muhaymin means authority over other books means it will tell you what is right and what was wrong because it why we should take that because Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not written this book it is coming from the master of the universe the creator of the universe so um, you mentioned that uh, Jesus's message is the same yeah if that is true then why are you telling me about Islam Jesus's message is the same so Jesus' message, so in Christianity, the, 
the message in Christianity and the message in Islam are two different messages in terms of salvation. We agree that miracles. When we look at the miracle, we said this miracle does not make anyone divine. It proves that he is a messenger of God. On the other hand, our Christian fellow brethren, with due respect, I, I love Christian brothers. They are humanity, uh, brothers and sisters. So I say, you look at this miracle and you make him to God. I would say that the miracles definitely showed that he was from God. Mm -hmm. But I think what made it very clear that he was the son of God was his resurrection mm -hmm. from the dead. So when you say son of God, like Bible also affirm that son of God means someone who is representative of God. Like and others messenger like Ibrahim mentioned, David mentioned as son of God and others also mention of God means um, they are vice gerent in this world and nominee in purpose means they will claim the message of God to community. Do you agree? referring to Daniel, the book of Daniel, where Daniel had a vision. It was after he had visions of lots of different beasts. And then in the vision, Daniel says, and then I saw one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. And what he's saying is not that it was a human, but the idea is that this person like a son of man was divine. And he came and he conquered. And he was set up and he was set on a high place and he was exalted over all creation. And so Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, and he's referencing Daniel. And that's why the Pharisees freaked out when Jesus said that he was the Son of Man. And that's why they said, he's claiming to be God, because they understood his reference, that he was calling himself, that he was putting himself in a place of divinity, because he was calling himself the Son of Man. And I, I would say, Quran constantly refute this idea, with due respect. Quran always addresses Son of Mary. So if someone says he's son of a man, Allah said, you know, he doesn't have a father. So we directly address the question. Allah said, where is Kala Isa ibn Maryam? When Jesus spoke to Jesus, the son of Mary. So that clearly, you know, Allah titled Jesus, son of Mary. Normally, when you see any children, they're named by their father. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the heavens there, clearly identifying Jesus is doesn't have a father and he has a miraculous birth and the Jesus born from Mary so the only woman given that title that she is the mother of Jesus here Allah making two things clear that Allah is telling that this is a miraculous birth normally conception happened between male and a female and the child come biological but this is not biological, this is... Right. 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 That's one. Second thing, that prove Mary's innocence when people are claiming or, you know, attributing bad things about Mary. She committed some sex, uh, uh, illegitimate sexual intercourse with... So, and then she pointed out to Jesus when he, she, he was born and he said, Qala inni abdullahi athani al kitaba wa Allah made them make him a slave and a prophet referring so when a baby speak on the cradle I don't know do you know this uh, miracle does it know it's I don't think it's there the Quran addressed this Quran said Mary pointed Fasharatilay sorry Fasharatilay Mary pointed that look this boy when the boy speak on the cradle it's not natural when this incident took place that shows the Mary's innocence. Do you mind if I go back to something that you said? Sure, sure. Um, so you said that uh, he's not called the son of man in the Quran, he's called the son of, of Mary, Mary yeah. because um, he didn't have a father, yeah. a human father. Um, maybe I wasn't clear, but we don't believe, he didn't call himself the son of man because he had a human father. He, he didn't have a human father, I would agree with that. He called himself the son of man, and that was a reference to the Old Testament prophecy about the divine son of, son of man. And it's called, it's, it says son of man in Daniel because 
at first he's talking about all these beasts and he's describing all these hideous beasts and then when he describes the next person that comes he says oh he looks like a son of man saying he looks human he doesn't look yeah. like a monster beast. and I, I know which one you're referring and i spoke to one of the i don't know he's a rabbi or not so when that prophecy was a son of a man and when the christian was referring to jesus they are rejecting jesus but muslim at least we believe jesus right but no they completely reject and some of them say this talks about isaiah but and i find an interesting claim about isaiah 42 where isaiah prophesies about a prophet will come and he clearly mentioned something very interesting you can have a look at very interesting he mentioned yeah so isaiah 42 let me but mustafa can you uh, find that isaiah 42 isaiah can you open it for me yeah, let me see. It's no good. What's your name? Aziz. Aziz Khana. Sorry? Khana. Khana. It's nice to meet you, Khana, you know. Uh, Isaiah 42, yeah. What do, want, what do you want to know specifically? Yeah, you know that word, Selah? Yes. Selah. Yeah. I, I would like to see this. Uh, I think in the verse no, 2 or 3. Right. So I think that's in Deuteronomy 33 too. No, that is the one in Isaiah 42. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll find it. So which is it, Isaiah? 42, yeah. It's called, yeah, Selah. Yeah, that was... So, what do you believe about Jesus? I believe that he is the Son of God and the Savior, and he's my Messiah. Excellent. Are you from the US? Yeah. The south of the US? No, I'm from the Midwest. Midwest, which is quite healthy in terms of its, um, um, you know, it, it, its um, propelling of Christ, Christianity in particular. But did you know that the term son of God in essence? Yeah, so here, number 11, yeah, 42. Let the people of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the mountain ship. So he's talking about the recitation of a book. And they, they Selah, the mountain Selah, if you will Google it, you will find Mecca. So that shows all these things here prophesized. You can find a lot of. Muslim scholars, in the Jewish scholar, and the Christian scholar, the one thing cannot deny that Salah is indeed Mecca. Now, question is, apart from Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Quran sing like a, you know, it mentioned as a singing. It's a one type of singing. Although we don't attribute Quran as singing, we call it a recitation. So that, and also mention about Kedar. Kedar, uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came from the genealogy of Kedar, which is which is one of the son of Ishmael. So that's Aijah's prophecy goes back to the, uh, the Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam claiming, of course, as a messenger of God. And then, sorry, sorry. So he's here, yes, Kedar also. Let the people of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout for mountain sheep. Uh, and also, let me show you the Kedar. Let the settlement where the Kedar lives rejoice. So the Kedar, so if you look at the genealogy of Kedar, you will find she is from Ishmael Atais. He's not from the other side of, other chain of, uh, you know, the Isaac and Jacob, you know, that yes. side, not this side. May I, yeah, sure, sure. So this is the beginning of the song. This is why they are rejoicing. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout. Sorry, my, my throat is hurting. So <laughs> Just give it to my hand, yeah? yeah, no problem. Please, please continue. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed, reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. And it goes on and on and talks about the Lord making him. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. To yeah. open eyes that are blind, to free captives. And that is why. So, can I just intro? And what we notice is that Christ never came for the Gentiles. Specifically, it states in Mark's Gospel that he only came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel and it indeed warns not to go forth onto the Gentiles. I just want to address a singular point which is often I find quite bemusing as to why Christians can't understand the term son of God with which you've made cl clarity. Oh, I of, talked with him about this. What did you understand with that term? Um, you, uh, sometimes it is, sometimes it is used to talk about 
about someone of God, and I was talking about the term Son of Man that Jesus used to describe himself. Specifically, he's referring to div divinity because he's referencing Daniel. Daniel chapter 7 verse 13 from Mark chapter 14 verse 62. But what I will say to you, just we go slowly a little bit, the term Son of God in essence means, and it's defined in Matthew chapter 5 verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. And we find this a replete statement from within the New Testament that those who represent God are given this title. In the recently, one well, of the recent, the um, Dead Sea Scrolls, which were discovered, the title Son of God is, synony or is um, synonymous with the term um, Messiah, Prophet, those who represent God are given those particular title. However, what we know of considerable consequence, the term God the Son is never referred to Jesus in the New Testament in particular. The term Son of God is ubiquitous to those who represent God. And we got the definition there in Matthew chapter 5 verse 9, in Luke chapter 3 verse 38, Adam is a son of God. In Exodus 4 22, Jacob is a son of God. Even Christ defines a son of God according to John chapter 10 verse 33, when he highlights Psalm 82 6 in conjunction with John 10 36. So son of God is simply a title for one who represents God, but it's carrying no divine title whatsoever. Which is why I talked about the title son of man, yes. which specifically refers to Jesus. And it's a divine time. Well, there are there are different categories of the Son of Man, which is also made mention um, that um, it's speaking about, according to lots of Christian New Testament scholars, they believe he's talk, is speaking about a future eschatological figure who will come in terms of the Son of Man. But in terms of that understanding, it says he will appear before the Ancient of Days. So he will then again be appearing before God, and he will be giving glory to God alone. So when we look at the, so just to re, just to re, to backtrack a little bit, because in Mark chapter fourteen verse sixty two. When the, when the high, uh, high priest or the Sanhedrin asks him, are you the um, Messiah, the son of the blessed one, to which Christ responds, I am, i.e. he's claiming to be the Messiah, but in no juncture does he claim to be God, which is what Christians have mixed up with, you see. They were, he was brought up for trial initially on the concocted charges of blasphemy. But when he appeared before the Sanhedrin, they didn't have enough evidence to charge him with supposedly he's claiming to be God and all they've charged him for are you claiming to be the Messiah which he's affirmed in Mark's gospel he never said he was God John 17 3 classic example my favorite verse which many many Muslims are very much tantamount to using so it says in that passage um, for this is eternal life that they may know you so Christ says this for this is eternal that they may know you as the only true God and whom you have sent the messenger Jesus Christ which is what we believe of him. The Greek word there, apostelis, which means a messenger sent by God in John 17, 3. And this is replete in other parts of the New Testament as well. So, for example, when we look at... Do you mind, sorry, do you sorry. Mind if I clarify something? Yes, please do. So you were saying that um, they didn't accuse him... Oh, sorry, this is not my name. That's fine, no problem. Um, you were saying that they didn't, that they didn't accuse him of of being the son of God at his trial. They didn't accuse him of being God. So the son of, so they accused of being, they accused him, are you the Christ? The, yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah, the king of the Jews. But, uh, but in Mark 14, 61 specifically, see in Mark and Matthew, the replies are different. In Mark's account, this Christ says, I am for you will see the son of man coming from the clouds of heaven. But in Matthew's account of the same incident, when the, when the question is posed by the Sanhedrin, Christ interestingly responds by saying, if you say that I am. So the accusation made against him, Christ is aware of the, the fact they're trying to crucify him for any given reason. But you know, they didn't have the authority to crucify him. That authority could only be given by, the, um, by, the, uh, by, uh, by Pontius Pilate and the Romans. But they had to have a good enough reason to execute him. So they, so, yeah, yeah, but that was a, a statement that they've attributed to him. However, he doesn't make any claims to being God, which is what initially the Jews were trying to get him for, you see. But Pilate wouldn't kill him for being God. Pilate would kill him for being a political problem. So they, they told Pilate that he was claiming to be but a if king that, yeah. because Pilate would care about the problem. But if that was the case, then he would have said, wouldn't have said, I don't see any wrong with this man. Which is what he said. Yes, precisely. So therefore, by him saying that he doesn't see any wrong with this man, with Jesus, he doesn't see he's made any claims of blasphemy. Yeah, so it means he's like the ruler of the Jews, being sent as the Messiah to them. That's what it means. Pilate said that he didn't see uh, Jesus as posing a political threat. Correct, correct, yes. So, so being the, the so 
so, so, so that we're not confused, let's do this slowly. Initially, the Jews are looking for reasons to do away with Jesus. It says that in John chapter 8, verse 40, where Christ says that you, I'm a man having been sent by God, yet you are determined to kill me. Meaning any reason you're looking for. And you can see the games that they're up to. This is something you probably never heard. But in John chapter 8, verse 58, in John chapter 10, verse 30, they're trying to imply to him that, that, that which he has not claimed. So the classic example, as I made mention, when he says the Father and I are one. What does that mean? He means one in purpose because the preceding verses say that. But what the Jews craftily do, because they're looking for reason to do away with him, is that he's claimed to be God. However, he sets them straight in the verses which follow that he said, I'm not claiming to be God, I'm simply claiming to be one who represents God. Is it not written in your scriptures that you are God's? and to whomever the word of God has been sent, that I have said, I'm the son of God. Notice what that title means, which I've explained earlier. It literally means one who represents God. That's all the, that's all the title carries. There is, so if Jesus never claims to be God, yes. why did he not defend himself by saying, I am not God, you're wrongly accusing me? In fact, if you look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 3 onwards, in that, in that particular incident, listen very carefully, and I'm citing from the contemporary English version of the New Testament in which it says that Christ forgives the sins of a paralytic man and he heals him. The Jews observe this and they say amongst themselves, Jesus must think he is God. Christ, having, he didn't hear them say that, or him observing and he, and he saw what they thought. He says, why do you think such evil things? So the thought that they're thinking he must be God is an evil thought according to Christ's statement in, John, in Matthew chapter 9. So repeat that slowly once more. In, this, in the contemporary English version, I've got it over here, I can show it to you. For some reason, my internet is slow. Is there a... Yeah, yeah. So, but you go to the CEV version, yeah? Can I, can I go to any version? You can, because in the other versions, he's got it. Oh, and, and he commits blasphemy. And blasphemy would be, in, in effect, claiming to be God anyway, because only God can forgive sins, apparently. So in that verse, some, I like to cite the contemporary English version as an example. So here it is. So hopefully this comes up, although for some reason, yeah, maybe some inter... Okay, brilliant, it's come up this way. Let me just... Uh, hopefully it'll come up, please, 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 please. Excellent. Come on, you can push it. I say, excellent. So listen, check this out. This is a passage I simply love to speak to Christians about. So Jesus got into a boat and crossed back over to the town where he lived. Some people soon brought to him a man lying on a mat because he could not walk. When Jesus saw how much faith they had, he said to the man, My friend, don't worry, your sins are forgiven. Some teachers of the law of Moses said to themselves, Jesus must think he is God. But Jesus knew what was in their minds. And he said, why are you thinking such evil things? Meaning you thinking that I am God is what you are thinking. That is the evil thought. Um, so you're arguing from verse 3. Yes. In every other translation. Yeah, it says blasphemy. It You've, says blasphemy. And what would blasphemy invoke? Because they said only God can forgive sins. Hence, Christ is claiming to be God because only God. So that's why he's committing right. blasphemy. So there, they're saying that he's blaspheming because he's claiming to be God. Yes. And he's saying that's what he's they're thinking. Thinking evil because you don't add your own, but just follow the text. He's so he's saying that this is an evil thought that you think that I'm thinking that I'm God based on the fact that I've forgiven sins. Well, that he's forgiven sins rather. No, it's an evil thought that, that they, they are thinking that he's blaspheming for claiming to be out. to be God. Exactly. So, so, so let's do this slowly. This shouldn't be difficult. It's very straightforward. Now take a deep breath, pause, reflect on what we're saying. So he's forgiven the sins. Not that he, notice that he, what he says, your sins are forgiven. He doesn't, good evening. He doesn't say, I, Jesus, forgive your sins. Okay. But because this is a power being given to him and the end of the verses show that, that they gave praise to God for giving authority to man towards the end of this passage. Yeah. But let's just, yeah. Well, not in this passage over here. So what we're referring to in this particular... Specifically, it says right here, the same passage. Where does it say? You may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Yes, the Son of Man is a common title to... No, it's not it doesn't necessitate a, a divine title. Son of Man is often given to human beings and there are other sons of men in the Old Testament as well. 
So what we saying, just like there are other saviors, like in Nehemiah chapter 9, there are many other saviors as well. Moses is referred to as a savior. In Judges chapter 2 verse 9, other people are referred to. What I'm sorry. Oh, what? Sorry, the distinction is that Jesus uses the article the, the son of man. Referring to Jesus. But he, but it just says like a figure. He's not saying I am what you call a divine being because notice he appears before the ancient of days. So he's appearing before God. Hence he can't be God. It's like for example in Psalm 110 1, he's sitting at the right hand side of God. Hence he can't be God. But one who represents God is given his figurative language of one who is a representative, hence like the right hand man. But they're accusing you of blasphemy for referring to the Daniel yeah, but and they're, referring, they're calling, saying that he's doing blasphemy for forgiving sins or for saying that someone's sins are forgiven. But you see, again, what I want to explain to you, this is an authority that's been given to him. We note that even in John chapter 20 verse 23, the disciples forgive sins as well. So this is replete and in John chapter 17 verse 21 and 22 and 23, he, this also is substantiated by that point. However, what I want you to centrally focus on is this verse. It's crucial for our understanding so we're not left in any doubt whatsoever. So just to repeat this particular point again, Jesus forgives the sins. He says, your sins are forgiven. The Jews observing what's going on say, according to here, Jesus must think he is God. But even if we're looking at your translation, Jesus um, uh, commits blasphemy, blasphemy would be what? that he's forgiving sins and only God forgives sins, hence he's claiming to be God. So why have the CEV translated it? Because it makes more contextual sense why the blasphemy has occurred, because he's claimed to be God. And to that thought that they're thinking, he's thinking he's God, he says, why do you think such evil thoughts? Meaning the thinking that you're thinking I am God is the evil thought. Make sense? Yes, yes. That's evil of you to think that because that's evil of you to think that I'm divine. Yes. But could not also it be he's saying that's evil of you to think that because that's evil of you to say that it's blasphemy for me to claim that I'm God. And then he clarifies by referring to himself with the divine title in the next verse that he is in fact. No, but that's your assumption. The term son of man is never used for in, in a divine sense because it's used because he claimed to because in that passage in Mark 14:62. Yes, it's because they don't want because they see him as a threat. He's come to expose them, their hypocrisies and their um, you know their evil. So they're looking for any substantive reason to get rid of him, you see. So what they then concoct are charges against him, that which he hasn't made reference to. So the 10, 10.30 of John, when he says the Father, I are one. So what they're trying to derive from that passage is his claim to be God from that particular verse. When Christ, let me tell you something. So when Christ is walking in the porch of the temple of, of, uh, of, of Solomon, in verse 23, the Jews surrounded him and say to him, if you are indeed the Messiah, tell us plainly. To which he says, I've already told you so. Told you what? That I'm already the, Mess I'm the Messiah. In John chapter 4, in John chapter 8, and in John chapter 10. He tells them he's the Messiah, yet because of their obstinance, they reject what he has to say. And hence, but, he, but note, he said, I've already told you so. I've already told you that I am the Messiah. But yet, then he says, yet you are not of my sheep. Those who are my sheep, they follow my way. For I seek not to do... So what he's essentially saying in these preceding verses, those who reject him, they're not from him. God who has sent him and sanctified him, for God the Father is greater than all, and he can give eternal life based on the fact that he's been given authority to do so, not that he does it of his own volition. Hence, the from verse 23 up until the statement the Father and I are one, is showing we're one in purpose. By you following me, you're following God and, and vice versa. So that is the context. And to further uh, um, um, I'll give you an analogy of that, when he says the Father and I are one, no, notice something very carefully here. I want you to think about this carefully. So when he says the Father and I are one, and the Jews pick up stones to stone him. Now at that singular juncture, when they pick up stones to stone him, he should not then have subsequently said, for which of my good works do you cast stones at me? If he meant, as you understand, that he's claimed to be God by stating the Father and I are one, he would have realized instantly why the, Jews, why the Jews are picking up stones to stone me, because I've made a blasphemous statement. However, it, but, however, he's totally oblivious to, and that is why he responds by saying, 
for which of my good works do you cast stones at me? No, but you're missing what I'm trying. You're missing totally missing what I'm trying to say here. It's no problem. You're just it's new to you as well. But what I want you to understand is when he picks up stones, when they pick up stones to stone him, had he claimed and meant when he said the Father I are one, is that he's making himself God, he wouldn't. He would have then understood the reason why they're stoning me is because I made this blasphemous statement. But he's told. But yes, and the fact is proven there in the subsequent verse when he's oblivious as to why they're doing it initially because he's saying, which of my good works do you cast stones at me? And then they say to him, listen carefully, and then they say to him, it's not for the good works that we cast stones at you, but for you, a man claiming to be God. Now the alarm bells resonate with Christ. Only now he understands when I've said the Father and I are one, they misunderstood or miscontextualized in which way I said it. So to silence them, he says to them, is it not to, to defend himself of this accusation? Is it not written in your scriptures that you are gods and to whomever the word of God has been sent and God who has sanctified and sent me? So what he's saying, guys, go back to Psalm 82 6. You will see. So go back to Psalm 82.6, which defines what the term God's, sons of God means. Those who represent God, i.e. angels, judges, powerful human beings who do God's work, they are referred to as sons of God. Those who sit in God's divine court with God the preceder, the one who's supervising the, the court. And these people are his representatives, the prophets, the angels, the judges, those who do. So in that context, he's trying to refer to them that I am a son of God. And then he says that. So what have I basically done by blasphemy by saying I'm the son of God? Simply by saying to you that I am amongst those who represent God by the definitive term, those who represent God are known as sons of God. Does that make sense? That's in John chapter 10, verses um, 20, uh, 23 onwards. So in fact, let's go to John chapter 10 you should have, and go from verse 23 all the way to the end. So this is why I've given you a slow breakdown and I hope you've understood the points I've made without me having to repeat them. Had he, when he said the Father, basically what I'm saying is if he meant that he was God by stating the Father and I are one, he would have known the reason why they're picking up stones to stone him because he's made a blasphemous statement. But the fact that is that they, when he says for which of my good works, so he's unsure why they're doing it because his intent wasn't to show that he was God. And then they say to him mischievously, it's not for good works that we cast stones at you, but for you a man to claiming to be God. So Christ now has understood what they're up to. So in retrospect, he's under, understood when I've said the Father and I are one, they've tried to make it appear that I'm claiming to be God. So then he sets them straight upon the explanation that I've given you from verse 33, 34 onwards by asking them to refer. Is it not written in your scriptures that you are gods? So he's asking them to refer to Psalm 82, 6, in which defines as I've explained. So rather than me having to repeat what I've said, Yes. Uh, is it not written in your law? I said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. You say of him who the Father consecrated and sent into the world. Yes. He's saying that he was consecrated and yeah, sent, and into, sent the to the world. Yep. So he's saying, why would you say that I am blaspheming? Blasphemy? Because I said, I am the Son of God. Precisely. So what he's basically saying, as God has authorized him and sent him into the world, then what is, the, because I'm in that, within that category of sons of God, as I've explained, then what have I said so blasphemous? Meaning, all I've said to you is that I'm one who represents God within the pretext of the definition of the term son of God, which he's making reference to. Does that make sense? I think you know what I'm speaking of. I think it's, it's, it's resonated with you now. I think that even if I want to stand in your Trinitarian shoes, I could not conclude that. Even taking away my, uh, uh, like my Muslim bias, 
I could not conclude that because the text won't allow me. You're saying we agree to disagree, but I've given you a thorough breakdown to show to you that he's refuted them in verse 33 and 34 by asking them to look at Psalm 82 6 to refer to those who represent God are known as you are gods, meaning those who do God's work. So he's within that same category of people who are within God's court, you know, referred to as the Son of God. So when hence he says to him, look at that definition. So he's basically saying, if you look at that de definition, what have I said which is so blasphemous by simply stating that I'm the son of God within that context of one who represents God. So you're saying disagree to disagree, but I don't, with due respect, yeah, I don't think you've got a, 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 a leg to stand on in terms of your understanding within what's been explained. Please do, yes. Yeah. So he says, I said you are gods, if you called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Do you say of him who the Father consecrated? He says that he's the one who the Father consecrated. You are blasphemy, because I said the Son of God. He's saying that he's not blaspheming by saying the Son of God. Yes. He's saying correctly that he is the Son of God. And he said, if I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the ones. And you may understand and know that the Father is in me and I am in so we say, you can't accuse me of blasphemy because I've done nothing wrong. I've, I've not claimed to be God. My miracles are showing that I am who I am and that my words are true. Okay, so I mean, uh, yeah, but I've given you the sound exegetical understanding because he's refuted their accusation against him by asking them, guys, use your noddle or use your brains. Those who represent God are known as sons of God according to your own scripture. So by me saying I'm a son of God, all I've shown to you according to that definition is that I'm within that remit. And then what's the issue with me being consecrated and sent and therefore I am within that son of God understanding which I've already explained to you. So it's for me it's pretty clear and dead clear. And I can't really, even with due respect to you, I couldn't, I couldn't even see it how you're seeing it. I can't even, without being biased, I can't even see what you're saying in this regard. It's pretty clear. And okay, and second point of more significance to you. The Greek word there for, in John chapter 10 verse 30 is a Greek word called um, hen. Okay, it's the same word used in John chapter 20 verse 7, uh, no, John, chapters, John chapter 17 verse 21 to 23, in which Christ says to the disciples, as you can become one with us and we can all become one. It's referencing the same Greek word hen. So in theory, you would then have to say the disciples are God as well. If you're going to use the paradigm of John 10, 30, when, it says, when he says the father and I are one, the Greek word one there is hen. The same Greek word used in John chapter 17, verse 21 to 23, where he references the disciples, you can become one with us and we can all become one. So therefore you would have to say the disciples are God. And if you even a further significance for you, the English word one, in Greek, there's hen in John chapter 10, verse 13, in John 17, 21, 23. But the word for one, the numerical understanding, is in Mark chapter 12, verse 28. Where the scribe says, so where the scribe says to Jesus, what is, oh, uh, teacher, what is the greatest of all commandments? And Christ says to him, hear thou, O Israel, your Lord God, the Lord is one. And the word there is haste. Haste means a numerical cardinal one meaning a singular one, one in, so we noticed two. So that would, uh, if that word haste had been in the text, you could have argued that, but it's not. It's hen, which is the same word used in John 17, 20, 17 verses 21 to 23. And the disciples can become one with us, we can all become one. And therefore you would have to conclude for the sake of consistency that the disciples are also God as well. So the whole passage in itself, right from verse 23, all the way to the end of the passage you've quoted is simply those who reject Christ, they're not of his sheep. Those who accept him because God has sanctified and sent him. So here, therefore he's trying to show, you're my enemies, you don't want to know me. Those who do accept my message, they are with me. So the Father and I are one in our purpose of bringing you guys back to worshipping God correctly because you have essentially transgressed. Hence, this is the reason why I've been sent to you. And furthermore to that, my favourite verse in the Bible, which everyone should be aware of it, Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Listen to this carefully. No need to bend the semantics. A rich young man runs up to Jesus. He says to him, good teacher. Listen carefully, very carefully. Good teacher, what must I do to get eternal life? Christ responds to him by saying, why do you call me good? There is no one, 
There is no one good except for only God alone. There you have it. So what have we observed? We've observed that he does not want to be called good, equivocates that title singularly to God because as a humble Jew, he realizes that in the grand scheme of things, only God is good. So he's rebuking that young man for calling him good. Now, when, when, so then when he, so then when he, uh, uh, so when, so I'll, I'll be very brief. So then when he advises the young man subsequently what to do by keeping the commandments, notice something very interesting here, which very few Christians are aware of. Perhaps you will be. When the young man then says, listen carefully, teacher, I have kept this commandment since I was a boy. What do you immediately notice? The young man has dropped the title good and simply calls Jesus teacher. Hence, he has understood when I've singularly addressed him, first of all, by calling me good teacher. God, uh, Jesus has given me a, a rebuke by, by confirming that only God is good alone. So when he redresses Christ, he simply calls him teacher, having thus understood that only God is good alone. So hence, Jesus cannot be God. And I'll tell you something else of more significance for yourself as a student of the Bible. If you read the same incident in Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, Matthew has such a problem because although you've got it as Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, by all Christian common um, consensus of scholarship, Mark is the first gospel. So it's actually Mark, Matthew, Luke and John, not Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Your Christian scholars say that. So on that verse, when Matthew sits down and reads it, the majority of today's scholars have observed how Matthew changes the response in Matthew 19, 16. When the same question is asked, in that response, Christ says, why do you ask me about what is good? Let's have a little bit of a pause here, but you need to reflect, you don't have the Bible in front of you. But Mark 10, 17, compare and contrast with Matthew 19, 16. There he's Christ, why do you call me good? Only God is good alone. Matthew reading this, saying, why is he only saying God is good? He, he changes the statement into a question by saying, why do you ask me about what is good? So he's asking the generic question of what is good, as opposed to in Mark's account, where he simply says, why do you call me good? which is showing that only God is good. So hence, Matthew has a problem with this particular verse. He arranges, rearranges the words to make it appear that Christ is not saying, why do you call me good? Only God is good. But saying, why do you ask me about what is good? So that is becoming more generic to asking about generally goodness. So you're saying that Matthew changed yes. the Bible yeah. because he didn't agree with Yes, and local, these, I mean, you're in Oxford today. Our local um, um, theologians here, Keith Ward, um, um, John Barton. Sorry, go on. Jesus asked a lot of rhetorical questions in response to him. And the young man said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, Why do you call me good? Can that not be a rhetorical question, making the man think? Just, hey, do you know why? You know, this is a common <laughs> response I hear from Christians. It's a rhetorical question. But there's, there's several objections to that. First thing is, if it was a rhetorical question, and hence he wants the young man to actually think who he really was according to what you want to understand from it, then the young man does not go away concluding, right, after Jesus gives him the advice, right, now I've got it, you're God. So the rhetorical question falls flat because what you're essentially saying, and if it was a rhetorical question, notice the grammar of the response. It would have made sense if Jesus said, do you know why you call me good? Those key words would have been added in if it was a rhetorical question. But he just says, rather says, why do you call me good? Only God is good alone. So if he did mean in a rhetorical manner, those three objections. Number one, the young, when he advises him what to subsequently do, the young man does not then go, go away concluding, okay, now I've got it, Jesus, you're God. That would have made sense within the rhetorical framework, okay, of what you're saying. From, from the passage, what he advises the young man to do is, uh, said, you know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness. The last ones that have to do with the relationship to people, and the man says, I've kept this, and Jesus said, you lack one thing. Go and sell, sell your belongings and give it to the poor. Yeah. Have treasure in heaven, 
heaven, come and follow me. Yes. And this is another thing which bemuses me as to why Christians then think, because he said, follow me, hence he must be God. No. What he's trying to say from that passage, having these wealth and so forth will not get you that king in, into the kingdom of heaven. You have to, because you have to go that, exactly. You have to go that step further to give away, to go follow, and then follow me and to live the, the humble life and to spread my message. So come and follow me if you really want to be certain of that eternal life by taking steps in addition to what God has already requested. So we as Muslims, we're required to pray five times a day. We follow five pillars. But if we want to attain certainty to get even closer to God, we do further actions to please God. So for example, these actions inviting people. So you're going over and beyond. This is what Christ is essentially saying to him. So again, to repeat that, that particular statement, he's, a, he's attributing godness, goodness only to God, where in fact he should have no real objections to be, being called a good teacher, because in fact we know he was a good person. So he shouldn't have then pounced on the young man and said, Yeah. Yes, which in, in essence means, and then he further elaborates on that by saying, why do you call me good? Oh, for only God is good alone. You see that answer your question. For example, us three are standing here. If I was to say to you, you're the only American here, by proxy, that would exclude me and the sister. True? So these are key words, you see. So you see, I think you've evaluated from the text within itself, the rhetorical argument doesn't, because I've heard this many times, but due to these three objections, simply doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So let's read the grammar for itself. Let the man speak for himself. Who was Christ? Mark 6, 4. Matthew 21, 11. Christians are very quick to um, point the fact that he wasn't a prophet. Are you together? Yes. Oh, okay, that's cool. Okay, fabulous. Hope you enjoy it. Very briefly then, so I don't want to delay you if you need to go. Sorry. That's fine. So about another 10 minutes, 5 minutes-ish. Is it nearby or I don't want to... Um, no, it's just having a nice interaction between the like, Muslim and Christian understanding of uh, Christ. So we won't be long. If you need to go, please don't hesitate oh, then just to say right. you need to go. So uh, in, in conclusion, what I will wrap up by saying, because I think we need to make a move as well. In essence, that Christ spoke of himself as being a prophet of God and a representative of God. Mark 6, 4, Matthew 21, 11. He never invites divinity upon himself. He, it makes it absolutely abundantly clear, I seek to do not my will, but the will of God of, as who has sent me. Of my own free will, I can do nothing. So I hear as my judgment, my judgment comes from God. So it's very, very clear. Christ's explicity was to one to which he was a prophet of God, a mighty messenger of God, who will return at the end time. So we believe in all this as well. However, he was not God. And he made and he, those passages which we've gone through, in a, in a consequential manner, prove beyond reasonable doubt that he could not therefore have been God. This is the singularity of what the Quran says, that God is not a man. Even in your books in Hosea 11.9, Numbers 23.19, that God is not a man. And this goes against the understanding of a creator who can be akin to his creation, which is the uh, polytheist, polytheistic belief, which is attributed to other faiths as well. Not that I'm saying that Christians are polytheists. However, they have attributed these things much later in Christian history due to the various councils which convened in the third in the century. The Council of Nicaea, the Council of Constantinople, the Council of Chalcedon. So these are where the development of Christ's Christology took place, where he was elevated to the persona of um, God himself. I would say that it happened before that. I don't know if, I mean, the Philippians is part of our scriptures and it says that Although born in the form of God, yeah, emptied himself. But that would be essentially to the cross. So he poured himself out. He emptied himself out. This is a common uh, understanding made by Christian scholars. It's not in reference that he emptied himself out, because I think it says in Ephesians that the fullness of God dwelled in him, dwelled, uh, dwelled in him, which would then would appear to be a contradiction. However, that's, that the, the Philippians passage is essentially a, a hymn which is attributed to Jesus or a poem, but it's not to Jesus as the source of it, because it says every knee at the end of that, every knee shall bow and every knee shall confess in the name of Jesus, but to the glory of God. So Christ would be a conduit, not that people will be bound to him, but in his name to God. I would agree with you that it can be sometimes hard to wrap my brain around the fact that Jesus was fully God and fully man. You know, and you would assume, wouldn't you assume momentarily that such an important facet 
like him being fully God and fully human, he would have explicitly stated this. Now, for example, when he appears in the Mount of Olives for the first time before, a Jew, before his audience, and he explicitly asks Peter, I think, as to who do the disciples think that I am? And they respond by saying, some think you are Elijah, others think you are that prophet, some think you are John the Baptist, but we know for you to be the Christ, which he affirms. Actually, on that point, yes. I think you see a progression in the understanding of the disciples yes. of Jesus and who he is. Yes. And I think in Acts 2, yeah. you get Peter declaring Jesus not only to be Christ, but also the Lord, yeah. which is the same word as the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament uses for Yahweh. Yes. So whenever they have Yahweh, they use the Lord. Yeah. So, um, so, the ter so the term look in the Septuagint is kurios. And Kurios is also be give, being given uh, titles which are yes, attributed. It can also be Sir. Yeah, and to, but, exactly. But particularly yes. in how he applies it in Acts 2, for example, yes. when he said, Therefore, God has made him, Jesus, yes. whom you crucified, yep. both Lord and Christ. Yep. I don't think he's saying both Sir and Christ because that would just be ridiculous. Well, he's saying both Lord and Christ as in both Yahweh. He really is Yahweh, and he also is the anointed one at the same time. But we say, look, because even Paul distinguishes in 1 Corinthians 8 6, for unto us there is one God the Father. Mm -hmm. So he's even consequently attributing the, the, the distinction between Christ and Jesus and one Lord Jesus Christ. Because yeah. what, Jesus, what Paul does, he breaks up the Shema and attributes the Lordship to Jesus. However, he's still only seen in the same way as. Um, uh, as uh, Sarah would be to Abraham by right? referring to him as the Lord and we can define that in, in Psalm 110 1 for my, for, uh, for my, lo my Lord says to Adonai says to Adonai yeah. and, 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 and on, on the point that the Father or God the Father is distinct from the Son that I think we are completely agreed on yes. because the, I think at least the way that Christians will understand it's not saying that Jesus is well the, the word, like when it talks about God and Jesus um, is saying that the Father is not the same as the Son, which mm. Jesus himself says. Yeah. Uh, he, for example, as you already quoted from John's Gospel, that the Son always does what the Father does. Yeah. At the same time, I think what... Um, well, it's very hard to understand passages like Mark 1, mm. how Mark's Gospel begins. Yes. When Mark begins by quoting from Isaiah. The, yes, Isaiah yeah. chapter 40, if yeah, I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Isaiah 40. Yeah. And when it's Malachi voicing, 3 1 as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Both passages, particularly Isaiah 1, it continues to, well, who is going to come? Actually, it's Yahweh who's going to come. But these are agency verses because even Moses is referred to in this way. That, for example, in the Gospels, it says that um, Moses said, don't honour your father and mother. But in Matthew's Gospel, I think Matthew 15, it says, God says those who don't honour their father and mother. So what it is like agency verses where the Yahweh texts are applied to, to Jesus, similarly the way they apply to Moses as well. Um, I don't think that's exactly the same because the way that scripture, uh, scripture is understood, at, at least from what I know in both Testaments, is that scripture is the word of God while being uh, transmitted through human agents like Moses. But because when, when Moses said something which is written down in the law, for example, honor your mother and father, yeah. that being divine scripture is the word of God even as it is also Moses' words there. But it is not saying, it's, it's different to saying that um, Moses is the one who came down the mountain, for example. But that's what I've tried to explain, these are agency verses? So what I've tried to show to you from... Yeah, but I, think, I don't think that is the... Uh, so Yahweh text can be applied to individuals, but they aren't, so for example, um, where Christ makes reference um, to in the Old Testament about Asif, which you're aware of, but obviously it's not Asif. So these are what you call agency texts, which can be used for these individuals. <laughs> so if you, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> Sorry, yeah, uh, but you need to make a dash. Okay. Oh, okay. I don't want to do in that case. I don't want to delay you, delay you. But what I would hasten to conclude in this discussion is that I think the evidence of Christ being who he claims to be is pretty tantamount. I don't see from within the, within the scriptures. We can do it sometime if you're happy to exchange numbers, we can have a discussion. The only thing is we live in East London and it's a bit of a track to come. However, we're thinking of coming here once a month. If you're happy to exchange numbers, we can have... Oh, next year. Oh, next year. Oh, Yes. Uh, how do you... 
how do you explain nice the scriptures that, for instance, yes. so you know, without you being can't come to the Father? Or that yeah. I'm in the Father and just as Father is with me? Or that all authority of the world has been given to me? How do yeah. you explain that if Jesus is not God? So, so say the first biggest story. Here's my, here you are, my friend. That's my name. You want, you want to take my, you want to know my number? Yeah, I'll, I'll come to your question. So where do I add? Okay, add phone here, yes? Yes. Oh. It was a pleasure talking to you. We really appreciate you. Um, that's my number. I don't know how you're going to save it. So. So can you repeat your question again, please? Yes, how do you explain for instance, no one can come to the Father? Except through me. Yeah, because he represents God. Therefore, it's incumbent upon those that Jesus is sent to, that they have to follow him to get to the Father, because he's a selected, chosen individual by God. Or that I'm in the Father. And the Father is in me, like in John chapter 14, verse 9. So that is just to show in a figurative language that God, God is within me in the sense that he speaks my, I speak his words. Like it says in that continuous saying that passage, when Philip um, says, "Show us the, show us the Lord," and, and Jesus says, "Have you not seen Philip? That he that seen me has seen my Father, and seen the Father. Um, for in my words that you, you, you I speak." So you can see God through him because in John chapter five verse thirty-seven it says God cannot be seen at any time, and in one John chapter four verse twelve it says the same thing: God cannot be seen at any time. So Christ, what he's referring to in this ex example, is simply to say that you can see God through me, not that he is God, because he represents God. And hence, this is the terminology that he uses. But again, John's Gospel, you know these replete statements which you're observing? He that has seen me has seen the Father. The Father and I are one. Before Abraham was, I am. Are you an Oxford University student? You will, if you go to a theology department and ask them as to what, why these statements are not found in the earlier Gospels of Mark, Matthew and Luke, most Christian scholars will say to you today, these were, um, uh, these were additions made by uh, those who um, have um, put these words into Christ's lips as if Christ said them. That's John's Gospel to a T. I just have a final question. Yeah. What about all the authority given to me? Yeah, so what we know is if you just look at the, the wording, authority given, that means it's not his by behest. He has to be given the authority to do the actions. So one who is given does not have it as a source of... I think the problem is God would not give someone who is not God the authority for the world. No, no. Sovereign authority is only resting in the one who is God. No, when you say, wait, listen, listen again, something which is given to you is not yours by default. Had it been his by default, he could have, just say for example, Christ never says in the New Testament, I forgive your sins. Rather, your sins are forgiven. Meaning he is, as man who's been given authority, like in... Sorry, I think this interpretation is too strange. It's too, okay. actions clearly are indicating his forgiveness. But anyway, anyway okay. Thank you so much. Okay, delighted to speak to you. Please do call me and... Um, those who associate others with God, and you will find the nearest of them in affection to the believers, those who say we are. You have seen it for yourself. Thank you. So, you know how what Quran talks about Christianity, you know. It's an amazing, you know, relationship, you know. But of course, we have similarities, but and also we have differences in our guidance. Practice. We have conveyed you the message. You can look it for yourself. Maybe do an investigation in Islam and Christianity with a prejudice. Take up your prejudice mind. Say, I want to look at, you know, rationally. See what, what which one makes sense. Maybe that message I'll give it to you. Look after yourself. Thank you. Thank you.